What is time? We can classify the progression of time and track it in many ways, such as with calendars, clocks, or even just by looking up at the sky for the position of the sun and moon. We interact with these time measuring devices frequently, yet we need to ask ourselves a question. Do we even know what time fundamentally is? This talk will be taking us on a journey to find out what time is, and this naturally begins with the idea that things have existed. We can look quite far back into the past, 13.8 billion years ago. No, that was not when the dinosaurs roamed our planet, but actually quite far before to what we call the birth of the universe with the Big Bang, and we have a relatively good understanding of what happened after that. The nuclear fusion began, galaxies and solar systems formed, and in the Milky Way, a familiar place developed its own history. Plants grew, and eventually monkey-like creatures we call apes evolved into what you can see when you look in the mirror. A person. But the past isn't just something cosmologists and historians deal with. Have you heard the phrase that you typically tell an overthinker? Don't live in the past? Well, I find this phrase quite ironic, since the past is basically all you are living. Now, this brings us on to what may seem a peculiar thought, that you are living in the past rather than the present. And I say this because everything requires time for signals to transfer information to a processing mechanism. And in our case, it's a pile of soft tissue and blood vessels located up here in our heads our brains. And the sending and receiving of signals is like when you order a package on Amazon and it tells you you will receive it in two to three working days. Our brain, it does a similar thing. But instead of relying on postal services, it relies on something called the nerve cell. And our brain alone has around 86 billion of them. And these can send signals at a speed of 50 meters per second. So let's just put this in perspective into perspective and say that I'm approximately 160 centimeters tall. So then we use the very well-known formula, speed equals distance divided by time, rearrange it for time to get time equals distance divided by speed. But when we substitute in my values, it takes approximately 0.032 seconds for a signal to send from my brain to my toes. So really not that much time, much time at all. But for a hypothetical 100 meter tall giant, the signaling speed of 50 meters per second would result in some potential issues for this giant, as it would take them two seconds to send a signal from their brain to their toes. This means that if the giant wanted to walk around, it would think in its head, okay, let's move my right leg. Two seconds later, it would start moving. It would be lifted into the air and placed back down on the ground again. The giant could then stare, at their foot for two seconds, seeing that it is touching the ground and not even feeling a thing. This is because time travels much faster than literally anything we know. The speed of light is three times 10 to the power of eight meters per second, which is just a three followed by eight zeros, which is well, you know, quite a lot of zeros. But what does this mean for us and not just hypothetical giants? Well, it means we're practically experiencing everything around us with a lag time. And this has some interesting implications in astronomy. There is an exoplanet super Earth called HD 156668b that is located 80 light years away. So let's say there were some extraterrestrial aliens on this planet looking at ours. They would see our planet in the midst of World War II. Isn't that just interesting? Now that we have some knowledge about what the past is, let's move on to the future, something that seems completely out of our control. But what if I told you there was a way we can predict the future? Okay, that's not a psychic's hocus pocus. Even you can do it, and I'll show you right now. So take a look at this cute little kangaroo holding a ball. It's going to lift up its forepaw, and you know, what is going to happen to the ball? Well, the ball is going to fall down, and we know that because gravity will be accelerating it. So we can use our knowledge about past events to predict what's going to happen in the future. But predicting the future isn't always that simple, especially when we get into the details of science. But 
it is actually very useful in our everyday lives. Like, it's like the basis of economists using their handy dandy supply and demand graphs to predict what's going to happen to stock markets in the future. And even you predict the future just by walking around to make sure a car won't hit you when you cross the road. So, this brings us on to the next thing. We have some knowledge about the past, we can make some predictions about the future, but this brings us to a gap, a gap that is, well, difficult to define, the present, an unattainable goal. The present is associated with the ideas of events being perceived for the very first time, but as we already discussed and said that we are not perceiving the present, but the past and that the future is something we can predict, well, what the present is is something we have to think twice about. So we could think of it as little snapshots, like when we have little pictures for a film, like we use in those old movies and we play them to generate motion. But time doesn't really seem to have gaps as we experience it. So what is it then? To recall, let's take a look at the tragic story of a chicken crossing a road. But the tragic thing in the version that I'm telling you is that the chicken can only take half the step it did in its previous stride. This means that the chicken can only take half the step it did before, so it's never going to reach the other side of the road. And time behaves quite like this. You can half the hour, half the second, half the minute to get an even smaller value to infinity and beyond. This means that time is an unattainable goal. We do not know what it is. We cannot cl classify what it is either. And now you may be feeling like the screws in your head have become a little loose. But whilst we're at it, let's just loosen them to the point at which they may fall out. So as you can probably tell, there are many strange things with time. But another is that time is a dimension and that this dimension is fundamentally connected with space to make space-time a name you frequently come across in your comics, your fictional comics about wormholes and time-traveling robots from the future. But you can also find it in your science textbooks, specifically in the section on special relativity, which betters our understanding of why different observers perceive the location and time in which events occur differently. This brings another story of time into play. The rate at which time passes depends upon your frame of reference. In space-time, we know the more the mass, the more the gravity, and the more the gravity, the more space-time curves. And that these places where space-time curves more, time appears to be running more slowly. And we call this time dilation. And it isn't only seen from a difference in space-time curvatures, but also from the relative velocities between clocks. And you may be thinking, oh, that seems pretty unbelievable, but let me just tell you, this science fiction has become science fact with the help of two very accurate atomic clocks that were synchronized. One of them was taken on high speeds in an aeroplane, and when they brought it back down on Earth, compared the two clocks, the one that was on the aeroplane appeared to be running more slowly and running more slowly by the exact amounts predicted by Einstein's equations. So, E equals mc squared, one of the most well-known formulas on Earth. Yet, it is missing out something. Einstein was not able to answer. Why can we move through space in any direction and in time only one? Notice how I can walk around in any direction I wish. But you do not see me doing these movements in the exact opposite sequence to how I did just now. This is because the arrow of time only seems to be going in one direction. So something we all have heard about, relativity, still wasn't able to answer some big questions. So now that we have thought twice about what time is, we realize we have missing pieces to the puzzle of time. We know that time is relative. We know that we can predict the future. We know that we are experiencing the past and not the undefinable present. We know all these things about time, yet we do not fundamentally know what it is or why it is for that matter. 
Every day we go around seeing things that are seemingly so obvious. We don't devote our own time to think about them more deeply, like what time is. And it is sometimes the most obvious things that hold answers to questions we never even bothered asking. So I ask you to take your time and notice the noticeable and ask yourselves why. Who knows, you may find out something interesting, deeply satisfying, or perhaps even revolutionary. All you need to do is think twice.